Okay, so I'm in a room. I'm laying in a bed, trying to open my eyes. Feels like they're glued shut. I try to wipe my eyes with my hand, but my hand is somehow fastened to the bed. I try to sit up, but my body feels like it's weighted down. It's like I've been weighted down with an iron blanket, maybe, like the kind they put over you during x-rays. In the background, I hear noises, beeping. Not beeping in any kind of rhythm, but beeping sporadically without rhyme or reason. And none of the beeps are the same tone either. They're high beeps and low beeps, trading off with each other in a chaotic chorus. Accompanying the beeps is this pumping, whirring noise. Sounds like a wind tunnel being forced through a drinking straw. Can't even dance to that. <laughs> so I keep trying to blink over and over till finally my eyes begin to peel and some, themselves open. It's dark, but somehow I can still see. On the other side of the room, there's this person standing there looking at a notebook of some sort. Am I supposed to know this person? Will she be offended if I don't recognize her or remember her name? I want to talk to her, but I can't think of a proper way to make an introduction. So I go with that salutation that's worked for me so many times before. What up, girl? <laughs> and a smile. She looks up, surprised. Hey, she says, how you feeling? That's a strange question, I think. I feel fine, I say not knowing how else to respond. This woman seems so ecstatic to be talking to me, so I figure I must know her. <laughs> it's not until later that I find out that this exchange was the first I'd had in over three weeks. I'd been in a coma. So here I am, just waking up out of this coma with this woman who is so excited that I'm awake, have no idea what's going on. Enter my family. Everybody is so excited that I'm awake and talking. I've never gotten such a reception before for just waking up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so my first response to this was, where is my purse? <laughs> and after that, where's my dog and who's taking care of her? And then, where's my phone? I found out later that my eyes were seemingly glued shut because of this medication they had, applied to, had to apply to my face. I'd been burned, and really badly. In fact, I sustained third, fourth, and fifth degree burns to over 70% of my body. Never even heard of a fifth degree burn before, but apparently that's what they call burns that go all the way down to the bone. My hands, I found out, were actually fastened to the side of the bed because I'd been pulling hoses out and ripping bandages off of my body in my sleep. And my body was actually weighed down. I had so many staples in my skin that the sheer weight of them made it impossible for me to sit up. And who knows what all that beeping and whirring was. It turns out that I was attacked in my apartment and beaten to within inches of my life. My friend was there with me at the time. He was beaten to death. And the person who did this must have thought that I wasn't alive because he set both me and my friend on fire in the floor of my living room. I was rushed to the hospital, which is where I'm finding myself now three weeks later. For the following months, I underwent multiple surgeries and weekly visits to a place they call the tank room. In the tank room, they give you this amnesia medicine that's supposed to make you forget everything that happened. Well, there's two problems with this medicine. First, because I had to visit the tank room so often and repetitively, I started to recognize and remember things. And second, the medication did not eliminate the pain. It was just supposed to make me forget that I was ever in pain in the first place. Anyways, the tank room is where they took me to scrape off all of my burnt skin 
to stimulate my new skin uh, growth. About a month after these operations and tankering visits, I found out that my legs would have to go. And I don't know if it was because the trauma of it all or the medication, but for some reason it didn't seem like a big deal to me at the time. I remember them wheeling me into the operating room and looking down on me and saying, okay, Deborah, we're gonna have to amputate your legs. And my only response was a question, does my dad know and what does he think about this? Because I knew he'd only let them do it if they had to. For the following months, every two hours or so, the nurses would have to come into my hospital room and wrap and rewrap my legs and move my body around and prevent bed sores. So while I was either pre-op or post-op, I had a lot of time to think. And I know now, but I didn't know then, that this is actually where I got stuck, or started to get stuck anyway. Because I started to think about what happened to me and my situation. Why in the world would this have to happen to me? I mean, I'm a good person, right? I never did anything intentionally to hurt anyone. I always tipped my waiter and smiled at strangers. Why me? I just didn't get it. And that's what I said over and over and over again. I just don't get it. I never considered myself to be a remarkable person like the kind you see on Ellen. <laughs> I never thought of myself as somebody who battles back from the brink of death one day and is climbing Mount Everest the next. I never wanted to be a hero or an inspiration. I'm just a regular, nice person who tries to treat other people like I want to be treated. End of story. Well, that's not what was in the cards for me. Apparently, I was one of those almost dead people. Not fair, I thought. Then I started thinking about how my life was gonna pan out from there. I don't have any freaking legs. I'm not an amputee, that's not me. I like to wear heels with everything and there are no fashionable flat shoes out there. What about skirts? How am I gonna wear a skirt now? And not only do I not have any legs, I don't have any skin either. Speaking of my skin, people used to compliment me on my skin all the time. What's happening to me? Who am I? What do I like to do now? I like to go backpacking and go to music festivals. I like to ride my mountain bike. And what about my most favorite thing in the world? Feeling the sand massage my feet as I walk on the beach. Never again. I spent days, no weeks, thinking about myself. What I didn't have and what I couldn't do. I thought about who I couldn't be and all the opportunities I'd never be able to take advantage of. I thought about how there was nobody in the world who felt like I did. I mean, sure, there were other burn victims, and sure, there were other amputees, but were there any other people out there who were beaten up, burned alive, and an amputee? I spent too much time thinking about these things. But oddly enough, I never once questioned whether or not I'd survive. Perhaps my family support, my faith, my stubbornness, my church, or a combination of it all attributed to this. But one thing I became keenly aware of was this. I was stuck. I mean, I was stuck in the hospital physically, but more importantly, I was stuck inside of my own head. 
look, I recognize that my experience is rare, and I hope that none of you ever have to experience anything like that. But one thing I also have learned is that all of us are at risk of becoming stuck inside of our heads, of spinning our wheels and not moving forward. But getting stuck can actually be a very positive experience because it gives us the opportunity to start over and to redefine ourselves. And for me, once I started thinking about things in a new positive light, the possibilities for my future became endless. And here's what I learned about getting unstuck. The first step for me in getting unstuck was recognizing that I was even stuck in the first place because I noticed it had become a thing with me. I could see the expression on the doctors and nurses' faces, one of cautious optimism, hoping I'd been in, be in a cheerful mood that day. And eventually, I saw that hope fade, and I began to see a look of dread on their faces when they approached me. And I thought to myself, oh no, I'm a total downer. I am that person who refuses to be cheered up. But that's not me. I'm a relatively happy person. Who am I to bring these people down? I mean, here they are working in a burn ICU with people dying left and right, and I'm bringing them down? How dare I? These people brought me back to life, and all I could do is concentrate on what I didn't have, and in a nutshell, what they didn't do for me. I came as close to dying as anyone should ever come, and all I could do was take for granted my survival. And it was at this point that I realized I have no right not to be thankful. So instead of thinking about the things that I had lost, I started to take inventory about, about the things that I had going for me. And that was step three for me, or step two, or three, whichever. <laughs> <laughs> I took inventory of all the positive things I had going for me. Getting unstuck was a process of wrenching myself away from self-pity. And this was not an easy process. So I started thinking about the things I had. I had my supportive family and church praying for me. I had a skilled team of doctors and nurses working with me. I had my dog. I had my close friends. I had my sharp wit and my sense of humor, which were gone, but are making a strong comeback. And although I sustained blunt force trauma to my head, all of my intellect was intact. So just as my bemoaning and self-pity seemingly found an endless source of subject matter, so did my spirit of thankfulness begin to grow. And once I thought of one thing that I had going for me, it reminded me of another, which reminded me of another and another and another. So once I took this inventory, I then had to figure out, what am I going to do with this? So that was my step three. What to do with this positive inventory that I have. I remembered the feeling that I had of not having anyone to relate to and how horrible that felt. So if there was a way I thought that I could use that to help other people, hmm, I decided then and there, I would help people who felt helpless and alone. I would reach out to those people who found no way to get out of the situations they found themselves in. Before I found myself in the hospital, I'd been tossing around the idea of going to law school. Well, if anyone who's ever attempted this feat will tell you, Going to law school is not an idea you just toss around. <laughs> you either go full on or you don't go at all. I was ready to go full on. 
So years later, after I was finally home and healed, I decided I would study for the LSATs, which is the entrance exam to law school, by taking an online course. This was my first step. It was a small step, but it was a step towards my goal. And ironically, the last and final step of me getting unstuck was taking the first step towards my goal. So I completed the course, I took the LSATs, and while I waited for the results to come, I went ahead and applied to law school. I didn't want to think of the broader picture of it all at that point for fear that I would become overwhelmed. Well, the results came in. They were good enough for me to be accepted. Fast forward three years, I've just completed all of my classes and I'll graduate on Saturday. <laughs> but don't be too cheerful because I have to sit for the bar in July. <laughs> I've worked for the legal departments of the Veterans Affairs and the Wounded Warrior Project. I've worked directly with Alzheimer's patients and have served as a mentor to my classmates. I don't want to minimize the effort that went into my mental focus change, though. It was a deliberate, conscious effort on my part to be thankful for what I have as opposed to what I thought I lost. I have to make this decision every single day. When I have to wake up and put my legs on to walk to the shower, to take my legs off, to take a shower, to put my legs back on to start my day, I think to myself, at least I have legs. <laughs> Last year, I broke my femur, and I had to go to every single one of my classes in a wheelchair and it made me so mad. But I had to refocus my thinking. Hey, I'm in law school. I'm going to be an attorney. One question I'm often asked is this. What happened to the person who did this to you? I hope they got him. Well, all I can tell you is he was arrested, indicted, placed in jail for one year, and then released due to lack of evidence. So he still walks among us. But for me to concentrate on him or on his whereabouts means for me to focus on something that is completely out of my control. In other words, it means getting stuck again, and I cannot let that happen. I've identified this as a very real possibility for me to find myself in a stuck position, and I've decided not to go there. Instead of focusing on that, I've chosen to focus on my future. And my goal from here forward is to use everything I have, which is a lot I'm finding out, to help somebody else move forward. Because every single one of us suffers from pain, whether it be physical or emotional or both. And your pain hurts you just as much as my pain hurt me. Pain is not something that can be graded. Suffering and loss are not things that can be quantified or qualified. One quick example of this is I remember every other day or so, they would have to come into my hospital room and take blood from me. And I remember dreading the pain and feeling so silly about it. I mean, I'd gone through so many skin grafts and tank room visits and amputations that a simple blood draw shouldn't, it shouldn't hurt me, but it did, and it hurt a lot. <laughs> so we all have our pain. And we're all living with this pain. And we're all trying to make it through this, as Prince put it, this thing called life. So if I can help someone else move forward, she just might be able to help someone else move forward. And on 
and on it will go. Thank you.